Today at the National Press Club, Senator Patrick Dodson, known by many as the father of reconciliation, he was appointed as Special Envoy for Reconciliation and Implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Patrick Dodson, today at the National Press Club. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and today's Westpac Address. I am Anna Henderson, SBS World News Chief Political Correspondent and a Director at the club. Today we are joined by Senator Pat Dodson, a Labor Senator for Western Australia here in Broome in Western Australia. Senator Dodson is the government's special envoy for reconciliation and the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We'll be in conversation followed by questions from journalists from the National Press Club in Canberra. Senator Dodson has worked throughout his life with the ambition of reconciling this nation to create mutual respect and understanding. A priest, a land council leader, adjunct professor, expert panellist, royal commissioner and more recently a federal politician. Through those efforts, Senator Dodson has earned the title of the father of reconciliation. It's a label that weighs heavy, but I'm told he has broad shoulders. He was elevated as a key member of the government's team, shaping the national conversation on the voice to parliament. But his voice has been seldom heard in recent months. He's been undergoing treatment for cancer. Today we hear from him on a lifetime of advocacy you can join us in the conversation at Press Club Ost or hashtag NPC. Please welcome Senator Patrick Dodson. <clears throat> we'll start with an opening address from the Senator. Well, firstly, I'd like to welcome everyone to Yaru country, my country. I acknowledge the leaders that have gone before me. I want to thank the Press Club for coming here to Broome and for making this possible. I want to acknowledge all those marvellous people out there working hard and have been working hard to help people understand the significance of this referendum and why it's so important for our country and encouraging people to vote yes in support of what the proposition is. I want to acknowledge all of those who have sent me best wishes and uh, encouraged me to get well uh, when I was ill. I am still recovering but I want to thank them all for that. I want to thank the Prime Minister for his leadership in this very challenging process of helping our nation find the basis for unity, find the basis for hope, and find the basis for courage. That is what the referendum offers to us if we say yes. It offers us hope, it offers us courage, and it offers us the basis to begin to trust each other so that we can work together in a way that delivers better outcomes for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this country. And that ultimately brings pride to us as, a, as a, an Australian peoples. That's all I'd like to say at this stage, but there's nothing to fear with this referendum. It's all about taking us forward. It has a vision, it has hope, and it has promise. The downside is voting no is not a, neg a neutral matter. Voting no is to say no to the recognition of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples and to deny them a rightful place in our constitution and to allow them an advisory body that can talk to the parliament and to the executive on matters that their communities are concerned with. Thank you very much. Senator Dodson, you have come here today to, to deliver this address and to engage in this conversation after an extraordinary lifetime of work in this space for reconciliation and for constitutional change. What drives you to continue on that journey? I think it's been the injustice that I've seen over the years, starting from a very early age, of course, when I saw uh, Aboriginal old people working in the sun, chipping grass for white people with the tomahawks, then carrying the water on yokes back to their, their camps uh, in, in the bush, 
and then seeing stockmen being treated uh, harshly and paid unjustly, working long hours, uh, experiencing the racism in, in, our, uh, in the education system, and then feeling the, the brunt of the dying race philosophy, really. I, I went to secondary school in Victoria in Hamilton, and there was a group of uh, Aboriginal people from Framlingham who used to come and watch me play football. And every year I'd wonder whether we'd all disappear or they would disappear as part of the passing race philosophy. I didn't understand it. I didn't know where it come from. But I had this fear that something mysterious was going to make us disappear. And that was the philosophy underpinning it, the Constitution, of course. But uh, what drives me, I suppose, is the ongoing injustice that I see. The out of, uh, out of care, or out of home uh, placements of our kids, the high levels of incarceration, the high levels of suicide that we see amongst our young people, the awful living conditions and poverty that I see, uh, the lack of hope that I see in the streets in my own hometown in Broome, uh, the, the, the awfully frustrating um, changes that are needed in the criminal justice system uh, and, and, the, and the, the, the so-called benefits that we should be enjoying are not being delivered. And that, that's what drives me, so we need to change we need to have an effective voice uh, to the parliament. We need to have recognition as the first peoples. Uh, you, you can't live in your own country and not be recognised. And that's the challenge for us as Australians. Uh, after the vote on October the 14th, um, people are going to have to look in the mirror and say, what have we done and why have we done what we did? And uh, where is it going to take us? And we can look backwards and we can look at the, the history and we know very, I won't go back to Captain Cook and his instructions, but I'll go back to the, the day of morning, 1938, when uh, Mr. Cooper and Ferguson and Patton and Pearl Gibbs and many others, Sir Doug Nichols and, and, and others, all gathered at uh, La Perouse and threw a reef into, into the ocean at that time uh, in, in acknowledgement of the way that Aboriginal people were being treated by the settlers. And, and, but out of that came the positive request that Mr Cooper put to, to the Prime Minister Lyons, that there ought to be someone in the Federal Parliament that looked after the affairs, the affairs of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. That never happened, of course, because in 1938, there was no clear head of power that the Commonwealth had any responsibility for the Aboriginal people. That came in 67, when the Australian people voted overwhelmingly in support of a change to our constitution that made it clear that the Commonwealth could make laws for the Aboriginal people, including every other race of people under Section 5126. So what drives me is the need for us to acknowledge the Aboriginal peoples as the First Peoples, not that they have special privileges, but there are injustices that have to be fixed as a consequence of the settlement uh, that has taken place and the way in which that settlement has, has, taken, has, has happened. We know from our High Court, our own High Court in Australia, that made it clear that the legal fiction of terra nullius was a lie, deliberately constructed to dispossess and displace the Aboriginal people and enable governments of the day to use us as the play tools for their particular purposes. Now, my, what drives me is to stop that nonsense, to give the Aboriginal people their, their voice so that they can also take responsibility for the direction of the future. And we're seeing that some of that direction is to be participants in the society. It's not about separatism, it's not about elitism, it's not about special privileges. It's about being able to navigate the course under our direction and under our judgment and under our responsibilities and our accountabilities. Now, that's what's being asked for and we ask the Australian people, the decent, good people in this country, and, the, and that's all Australians, I'm not separating anyone out here, all Australian people, to support this simple proposition, a very humble proposition, to create the recognition of the Aboriginal people in the Constitution and to give them an instrument, a voice, a body through which they can say to the Parliament and to the Executive what the concerns are and what the ways forward are for us to go because we're bogged down in a, in a, in a cul-de-sac of, no, of going nowhere at the moment. We know that from the closing the gap statistics and all the other social indicators. We're going nowhere and the No campaign wants us to stay there. We can't afford to stay there because that doesn't take the country forward. It doesn't redress the serious problems that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples live under every day of the week.
And when we hear from the No campaign the concerns that are raised about domestic violence, about children not going to school, about the disadvantage in remote communities, there's obviously a completely different view from the different sides of politics about how that should be addressed. But you were a Royal Commissioner on the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody Royal Commission and you do hear questions raised about why there hasn't been more action at a federal level to at least bring the states and territories on board to address every single recommendation that they can in the current era. I mean, why hasn't that been able to happen in your view? Well, if you recall, the recommendations of the Royal Commission, 339 of them, were made at a time when we had a body called ATSIC. And the intent was that ATSIC would play a role with the government of the day and the governments, the state governments, in the implementation of those 339 recommendations. Within a, a matter of years of the recommendations being made, ATSIC disappeared. So there was no national entity to help drive a national agenda to deal with all of those recommendations. Now, what's also happened is that people have slipped back into the forgotten about the Royal Commission, although it's 339 recommendations, are still the best basis upon which to make the reforms. And state jurisdictions uh, are basically accountable for most of those impl implementations. Uh, there is a great need for us to, to redress that. And there is need to look at the coronial inquiries, to, to look at an oversight of how those recommendations are being put into place. But today we're not talking about the Royal Commission. Today we're talking about the referendum. Today we're talking about a, a vote that the Australian people will cast. A very important vote. The most significant vote they're going to make for a very long time on this matter. And that vote will determine what we as a nation are going to stand for. What are we going to stand for in relation to the first peoples of this country? And how you cast your vote uh, is terribly important. And, it would, and then the, on the day after, have a look in the mirror and ask yourself, how is this going to impact your kids and yourself going forward? Are we going to go forward or are we going to go backwards? Or are we going to cop more of the same? Are the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people going to be at the table or are they going to be picking up the crumbs, as we have been for the last 200 years? So we're going to be at the table making decisions or picking up crumbs that fall off the, the table of those that make decisions about us. When we travel around the country speaking to people who are undecided, one of the key cut through messages that they have taken in from this campaign is lack of detail. We don't know, they say, what we are voting on. Do you think it would have been easier if draft legislation could have been put forward? And can you explain that decision making process and why there isn't more detail behind the question and the, the pages of information that have been provided so far? Well, the Constitution is about principle. It's about principles that parliaments or governments use to make legislation upon. And if the legislation is uh, not acceptable to the public or some section of the public, they have a right to challenge that in the court. Now, you don't put detail in the Constitution. And so what we're talking about in this referendum is putting a principle, the principle of recognising the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples. And then a, a principle that allows them to have a voice that makes recommendations. It doesn't bind the parliament, it doesn't control the funds, it doesn't set up the programs. It simply gives advice to the executive and to the parliament on the better ways to do things with the public funds that are put, put towards programs and, and other factors. Now, if you, um, if you want to um, uh, walk away from that, then you're left with the hands of the politicians making the decisions. You're left with the bureaucrats determining and deciding how the lives of Aboriginal people are going to be controlled. And you're left to the women fancies of the greatest lobbyists around the country that want to determine how their futures are going to be, be, be uh, lived out in this country. The debate and the tenor of debate has been divisive, at times racist, and it has caused a lot of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've stepped forward to promote a yes campaign personal hardship because of the way they've been treated in the public discourse. You've been watching all of that. What do you make of it? Well, it saddens me. It, it seriously does sadden me that uh, that division and, and, and acrimony has crept in uh, to the debate. But what further worries me is 
this goes to the very fabric of our civil exchanges as a democratic nation. This is not just about the Aboriginal referendum here. This is about the nature of our civic society. This is about how the polity of our country is governed and run. And this will, be, this will affect us into the future as, as the modus operandi of what and who is accountable in the way they conduct public discourse. And that's the bigger worry. And most people haven't woken up to that as yet, I don't think, because it's, it's so obfuscated in the process. But it does worry me that uh, th there's no baseline here. This is run through social media. It, you can say anything. It's deemed to be truth. It's seemed to be of value. There's no weighting of the arguments. There's no real analysis of the arguments. Uh, there's no historical dimension. There's no acceptance of his history. There's no acknowledgement of the, of the legacy that history has created. Uh, there are consequences from colonisation. Uh, you know, there are serious consequences. Well, well let's, let's address that because at the National Press Club it was the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Jacinta Nampajimpa Price, who said on that, on that platform she didn't think there were negative impacts from colonisation. Uh, how did you... What, what's your response to her view? Well, I, I look to the serious social dislocation on many of the social indicators that Aboriginal people now sit in. Now, if we, was, if we were in the promised land that some people might want to suggest we're in, then why are we having such high rates of suicides? Why are we having so many of our kids being taken away and put into out-of-home care? Why is there so much domestic violence and internal violence within our societies? Why are we living in poverty? Why are we still uh, suffering from mental health problems? And, and why are our kids the, the victims of drug and alcohol, uh, you know, uh, opportunities that society offers. So we're not, we're not in, the, in, in the Garden of Eden here. There are the consequences of how we came to be colonised and they have to be dealt with. And so uh, the benefits that have come through civilization or through colonisation or whatever the brand you want to put on it uh, are well and good. They, they're good things. No one's denying them. But there are legacy issues and responsibility and accountability issues for how you've taken someone else's country and subjugated them to the policies that you have. Simulation, uh, control, management, domination, determination of their futures, taking kids away, stolen generations, all of those things have consequences from the first point of taking their lands and subjugating them to the policies of government to achieve the objective, which is the benefits that the society now enjoys. When the, the National Party came out very clearly and said they would be campaigning for a no vote, and then the Liberal Party followed and said very clearly they would be campaigning for a no vote, with your deep understanding of the history of constitutional change in this country, at that point in the process, did you ever think it would be better to hold back? and not proceed with this referendum now? I, I, I paused for a moment because I thought, well, yes, that's be the, that, that'll be something to do. But then I said, uh, well, this question of recognition goes back well before my time. It goes back to the leaders that I've uh, admired, Vincent Lingiaris, the Mr. Coopers, uh, Mr. Ferguson, Patton, Pearl Gibbs, um, Doug Nichols. Uh, the, the Pilbara Strikers, uh, you know, it, it goes back to a long way of struggle for recognition. And I've been party to and I've had the privilege to be on committees where we've tried to grapple with this. Uh, how do we get the Australian public? I, I, I chaired the Reconciliation Council for what's six years of its, its existence, trying to find common ground. I uh, work with the wonderful deceased now, Rick Farley. Um, you know, trying to find common ground between pastoralists, Aboriginal people and pastoralists, and many other industry groups, miners and others. So the importance of recognising the First Peoples in this country is significant for the nation. It's a significant matter for the nation, not just for the Aboriginal people. And that's what people are going to have to ask themselves on the 15th of October. Have we dealt with this legacy issue? of denying 
the first peoples of this country or have we actually owned up to it and have we acknowledged that and therefore we're not going to bequeath we're not going to hand that legacy on to our future generations we're going to put a stop to that lie and we're going to set down a new foundation upon which we can build at this point in time looking at the polls over a, a long period now and the trend which suggests that this referendum is very likely to end in a no vote. What is your reaction to that? And, and what hope do you see over the next couple of days of actually changing minds? Well, we've got a section in the constitution now, which sets up the process that we're going through, the referendum process. That is the majority of voters in a majority of states. I'll wait until the Australian people make their mind and their, their wishes clear. I'm not going to be ruled by polls. If we want to be governed by polls, then why would we have a governor? We just want a pollster and decide how we're going to work and live. Now, I think the Australian people, and there are many of them, that are still to vote, and I'd encourage them to vote yes in this referendum. There's nothing to fear here. There's only good to come out of this. There's a vision to come out of this, and there's hope to come out of this. So the truth of our integrity as a nation is what's at stake here, the truth of that. And we will need to face up to that on the 15th of October, once we know what the, what the outcome is. I'm, I'm confident that we are able to get sufficient votes and a sufficient number of the states to get us across the line. I, I'm not, I don't believe in the polls. I was in the, I was in the, in the um, opposition when Bill Shorten was the leader and we thought we were going to win government. And of course we got the biggest hiding possible and we never went anywhere. So polls tell you lies and don't believe them. If you're fearful about the confusion, vote yes. Don't vote no because no takes you nowhere. The Indigenous disadvantage question has been at the heart of this and nowhere is that more obvious and more uh, on show than in the most remote communities in the country. We're here in Broome uh, and, and you are very well aware of the situation that many communities face as you drive hours out of Broome, out of Darwin, out of Alice Springs and other parts of the country. If this is a no vote this weekend, what do you think it says about the future of funding and support for different Aboriginal nations to to remain on their own land and get support? Well, I, I'm not going to go into the uh, draconian agenda that I sense the, uh, the, the opposition have got if they, win, if they ever win government. Um, it's just too awful to contemplate, quite frankly, in terms of the progress that's been made in supporting or establishing Aboriginal organisations to respond to the needs in our communities, the legal services, the land councils, health services, the uh, uh, other agencies to help our communities. Um, those, those agencies need to be supported and, and not brought to the ground. Um, I, I take a view that we as a nation have got to uh, deal with not only the legacy issues of how colonisation took place and the displacement of the Aboriginal people, but we've got to deal with a, a future that is based on trust, based on respect and based on mutual obligations here, mutual response. Now, there are, there are some people who talked about mutual obligation, but they corrupted it. It wasn't a reciprocation. It was a one-way street. So there's got to be a mutual reciprocation if you're going to talk about mutual trust. If you want me to do something, then you've got to do something in return. We have this opportunity now with the referendum to change the way we relate to each other and the way governments go about their business. If you want the government to deliver more of the same or to become more draconian, then vote no. If you don't want them to go down that path, vote yes. We have a lot of questions from journalists in Canberra and I'll come to them after this last question I have 
for you, Senator Dodson, whatever the outcome this weekend, there will be more focus on how the land councils across the country operate. And there have been a lot of questions raised about whether or not there is enough transparency in the operations of Australia's Indigenous land councils. Do you welcome that? Well, I must declare that I was the director of the Central Land Council for part of my uh, uh, period of life. And I also uh, was, uh, was a director of the Kimberley Land Council. So I, I come out of the Land Council kind of background. Um, and these are statutory entities that were set up uh, back in the 70s, in 76 or 70, whenever. Uh, and they were set up primarily as a response in the Northern Territory initially to the, to the awful outcome, in the sense, that took place in that uh, Nabalco case, where the court basically said that Aboriginal people didn't have, a, didn't have a form of title to their land. So to get around that, there was an inquiry by Justice Woodward and his recommendations were that there be legislation that gave Aboriginal people a capacity to say yes or no to what happened on their lands. Now, if you get rid of land councils, you're getting rid of a very important principle, which is enshrined in the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights, free prior and informed consent. So you're getting rid of that principle in, in that's enshrined already in that legislation, but you're also getting rid of a huge structure that's important for the welfare and well-being and the rights and interests of that section of, of the Northern Territory or those sections of the Northern Territory, but also another under other land rights uh, 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 organisations set up under other entities. So it's, it's fairly... Uh, backward looking to destroy what has been effective, useful instruments, not only for the Aboriginal people, but for facilitating the way in which the industry groups are able to interact and assert their interests or, or bring their interests to bear, and for that to be responded to by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples when it comes to impacts on their lands or on their people. So if you if you if you're about no, you're about getting rid of any capacity for Aboriginal people to say no on matters that are critical to their future and to their culture and to their sustainability. Uh, and, and if it trickles down through our organisations like land councils uh, and medical service, well, you might as well just put the bureaucrats back in charge, bring back the native protector and let those people decide how the Aborigines are going to live uh, and determine how we're going to do and what we can or can't do and when we can do it and, and, and who we should talk to. I mean, I mean the, the awfulness of not recognising the rights and interest that Aboriginal people have got and should be honoured. I mean, Mabo showed clearly that the Aboriginal people and the Torres Strait Island peoples have got rights that preceded the colonisation of these lands. And our High Court discredited the legal fiction or the fiction of terra nullius. It discredited that. Our whole administrative land tenure system and our public policy system has been based on a discredited lie. Now, by voting yes in the referendum, we are simply catching up in many ways to what the High Court has already said, that the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples were the first peoples of this country and that they should be recognised as such and they have certain rights that are not those rights given by the Crown. They come from this thing called native title. So we as Australians are not dealing with the old colonial debate anymore. We're dealing with a new context where the rights and interests of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples have got to be accommodated within our structure. And we only do that, or we can start to do that, by a positive response saying yes in this referendum. Because that gives us the basis. We've recognised the people. You can't deal with people if you don't recognise them. You pretend they're not there. You tell lies about them. And then you subjugate them so that they're incapable of having a say. So that's, there's no justice in that. There's no pride in that. There's no integrity in that. And is that what we want to be known as, as Australians? Or do we want to be known as people of the fair go and giving people a fair chance and recognising the integrity and quality of, of the people that we're dealing with? and let them come to the table at a, at, on an equal basis to negotiate what it is that they're, they're wanting to assert in our political framework or within our political framework so that that can be accommodated without shattering that framework. 
So this is what we're talking about, is our nation going forward in a positive, constructive way, but it depends on us, the Australian people, the Australian voters. If we're in your hands, it's not the politicians, it's the people of Australia. We're in your hands, there's nothing to fear here. It's all to gain. Let's bring in our colleagues from Canberra now. And our first question from the floor is from David Crow. Thank you, Anna. David Crow from the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age of Melbourne. First, thanks, Anna, for hosting this from Broome. And also, Senator Dodson, thank you for your address. And I know sitting here in Canberra, uh, you have friends and family in the room here who are wishing you well. I think they'd rather you, they were seeing you up close, but on a screen is OK as well. Uh, my question is about um, your uh, long work over many decades on reconciliation. You're called the father of reconciliation for good reason. Many years of work in bringing Australians together. So I have a personal question for you about the outcome on Saturday. How will you feel about a country that votes yes on The Voice? And because this is a binary choice, I want to also ask you, how would you feel about a country that says no to The Voice? Well, the, first, the, the answer to the first question is easy. I mean, if we vote yes, then there's a lot of hard work the government will have to do um, to get the detail in the legislation and to obviously uh, begin those negotiations with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but also with the crossbenchers and with the, uh, with the opposition. Um, because uh, that's the next step out of a yes campaign, if it's successful is to develop the legislation and to get that through the parliament, hopefully before the next elections. Uh, but on the other hand, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd have take great pride in the fact that the Australian people, the Australian people have stood up yet again against the odds and said, well, we're not putting up with the nonsense that we're being told. We do know that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the first peoples, and we're gonna vote yes in support of that. And that would bring great pride uh, to me, it would be, a great uh, recognition of some of the work I and others have been trying to do over many years and it would make uh, uh, our way forward a lot easier. On the other side of your question, if we say no, then obviously that's going to be a very uh, a matter for us to reflect upon. We're going to have to look in the mirror and say, who the hell are we? And what have we done? And now what are we going to do about it? And that's the question we'll have to ask. It's not just a question for the government. It's a question for the Australian people, as it, not, as it is, will be for the government. The challenge will be for us to try and develop what the South Africans did when they got rid of the apartheid regime. They had to develop these uh, dialogues and scenario planning uh, processes. They had to develop a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in order for that country to try and heal from the, from the, the woefulness of that uh, apartheid policy and to try and go forward. And that's a scenario, that's a planning, that's a kind of uh, political structure they wanted going forward. So we would have to seriously look at getting rid of these notions of consultation and, and, um, and simply uh, bringing some groups together and getting what they want to say. It's going to be a structured process because the nation is bogged down in division here. Rightly or wrongly, it's bogged down in, in a divisive position and that doesn't augur well for our nation and the no campaign will have delivered that it will have delivered that it's re it'll reopen a, a scar and a sore that we thought we were trying to heal with the with the apology with the advancements in the high court and Marbo and Wick in the in the more proactive policies about the COAG agreement with our organizations we, we, we thought we were going forward here the no campaign will take us backwards and that to me, it's just the sorry part of the outcome for the No campaign. But we will have to change the methodology and you still have to engage with the Aboriginal people. Uh, they're not going away, they're not disappearing and uh, they may be a bit more stroppy than I am when they come to deal with you. Our next question is from Jane Norman. Senator Dodson, thank you for addressing the Press Club today and we wish you all the very best with your recovery, just to echo David's remarks. Um, I know this is all about the voice, but if I can put it aside just for a moment to perhaps look at other 
um, structures, reforms that the government might consider after October 15. An idea that has been put forward during this voice campaign is for designated seats for First Nations Australians in the Senate. I'm just wondering if you think there's um, any value to that idea. And also just uh, back to what you were talking about with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Is that something that Australia will genuinely have to consider if indeed it is a no vote on October 14? Well, I don't think dedicated seats are the answer. Uh, and secondly, I think that uh, the Uluru statement has called for a truth-telling process and the government's committed to implementing the Uluru statement in full, which involves truth-telling and agreement-making, treaty-making. So we'll have to consider and weigh up that as, as a government. But in terms of how we go about the healing process, well, that may be more than just telling the truth of how we've perceived each other and dealt with each other. It, it may have to go to these more substantive institutional blockages that we don't seem to be able to get over as a nation. You, you, you can't deny a people whose culture has been here for 60,000 years. And if that's what happens with a no vote, that's what you're doing. You're, you're saying, you, you, you people have no history here. You have no legitimacy here. You have no right to be here. Now, that's an intolerable proposition. Now, how the Australian people deal with that is as much of a challenge to them as it's going to be to the future government. But as I've suggested, we've got to change the methodology by how you ascertain the views and interests of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but also as you try to decide what the, what the scenarios are that would be possible for better this service deliveries, better participation, better quality of outcomes and greater levels of, of uh, governance for First Peoples in the way that things get done. Now, they're all discussions that will need to be held and uh, no doubt a responsible government will have to look at how best to pursue that. We'll go now to Rosie Lewis. Thanks, Senator Dodson. Rosie Lewis from The Australian. Noting your title as Special Envoy for Reconciliation and the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, are you hopeful after this referendum, regardless of the result, you keep that title? And if the vote goes down on Saturday, what does reconciliation look like in your mind without a voice? Well, whether I keep a title that's given to me by the Prime Minister and, and, and people in the, in the senior parts of the party, but it is a matter for them. Um, I'm not interested in holding on to titles if they're of no value. And if I can't make any contribution to the responsibilities that, that come with those titles. So that's a matter for, for uh, senior people in the party and the leader. Uh, and I don't think it's a, it's a matter that's preoccupying anyone's mind at the moment. In, in terms of the, the, your second part of the question, which goes, you just remind me about it again. Reconciliation looks like without a voice. Uh, well, reconciliation will look as it looks now. It, the, the, it's the challenge of the Australian people to find common ground with the Aboriginal people. It's a two-way street. This is not a one-way street here. This is a two-way street. It's about the non-Aboriginal people, the, the majority of people in this country who have made it their home, who, who are raising their kids, who are paying their bills, who are trying to get on in life. It's about those people and the Aboriginal peoples, who some of them have been successful, some are not so successful, a lot in jail, and a lot of young people have got no hope. So what I worry about is the future of our young people, and that's Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Do we want to leave them with a legacy that we stand for supporting lies, that there are no Aboriginal people here and there's no need to recognise them? Is that what we're going to stand for? Are we going to stand for the fact that we're prepared, because we've got the capacity as the voters, to put them in the Constitution, to recognise them as the first peoples of this country and give hope to our young people, to give hope to the future generations, that we put to bed a, a perennial lie that we know is a lie, the High Court said it was a lie, and we get on with developing what the future pathways are going to be and give our young people the hope 
that we can do better and we will achieve better. Because if we don't do that, then what we're going to see is more of the same. The social, anti-social behaviours in our, in our communities and in our societies, which leads to custodies and on all the other awful things we know about. Let's bring in Paul Karp now. Thanks very much, Senator Dodson. Um, Anthony Albanese has said he'll respect uh, the outcome of the referendum uh, and not legislate a voice in the event that there is a no vote. So I, I want to return to the theme of the last two questions about what practical steps for reconciliation and um, practical outcomes can be taken regardless of the result of the referendum. And one, one specific example, do you think there is merit in trying to address the gap in outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians through something like a Human Rights Act that would give a right to non-discrimination, a right to health, education and adequate standard of living without having to run the gauntlet of entrenching those in the Constitution? Well, there's a couple of things in your question. Uh, the, 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 the first thing is the, um, the non-legislation. I mean, if the Australian people say no, and the Prime Minister's acknowledged if that were to be the case, there'd be no legislation uh, to follow. Now, that'll be a very sad outcome, uh, but that would be recognising and respecting the wishes of the Australian people. And that's the burden the Australian people have got to weigh up when they cast their vote. Do you want to go forward or do you want to go backwards? Or do you want to do nothing? And do you want to look yourself in the mirror and have pride the next day or have some doubts and uncertainties and even an increase in shame. So that question of legislation is, is a matter that we will need to deal with when we know what the outcome is, what the Australian people have said. And the detail that people keep banging on about is where that takes place. The debates, the discussions, the further consultations will be about the detail of, of how representation takes place, functions, powers, etc. It all takes place going forward after a successful referendum. So detail is in the legislation, as it is with any other thing we do in this country. Detail is always in the legislation. There's nothing extraordinary about that. Now, your, your second part of your, your question, I'm afraid of, it was so long-winded I forgot it. <laughs> Well, this is not, not quite as bad as uh, Keating, but uh, I'll take that. Um, a, a Human Rights Act, uh, that is not something oh, yeah, that would, is contravened by the Prime Minister's promise not to legislate a voice in the event of a no vote, um, but is that something that could improve practical uh, outcomes for, uh, for Indigenous Australians? Well, you know, you're optimistic to think we're ever going to get a Human Rights Act nationally. Um, you, you can't even get recognition in the Constitution. You know, we're battling with recognising the First Peoples at the moment. And, and you, you're wanting to go a step further and say that the Parliament ought to consider a Human Rights Act that would deal with the rights and interests of its citizens when it's been so opposed to that. You've had inquiries into this, you know. Uh, it relies on the common law. It doesn't want to see the, the, the American situation in, in built in Australia. Um, and in fact, the, the, the recommendations that were made when Mark Liebler and I chaired the expert panel, one of those recommendations uh, to be put in the Constitution was a non-discrimination clause. And we'd also proposed a, uh, a revision to Section 5126, which would have a preamble, a statement to the head of power and get rid of the word race and put people in there. So we take a long time in this country to develop things that are positive for the quality of our nation. And to get to anything like a Human Rights Act, you would have to undergo an extensive education program. And that would require goodwill on behalf of all peoples. And that's what I'm trying to appeal to today. One of the best things about our country is goodwill can't be decided by polls. Goodwill is in the hearts in the aspirations and in the hopes of the Australian voter. And the Australian voter has a chance to give us all hope and, and remove the fear from the politic that we've seen. 
If you're just joining us, we are live from Broome with the National Press Club address uh, and questions from journalists for Labor Senator Pat Dodson. The next question is from Trudy McIntosh. Senator Dodson, I was wondering if you could provide us your frank assessment of how the Yes campaign has gone. Why do you think so far they've struggled to convince everyday Australians to enshrine the voice in the Constitution? Okay, well, if I had the answer to some of that, I, uh, I'd be a genius. But um, uh, obviously, um, it's a, we live in a complex world. Communication is, is uh, you know, the method of communication today is far more intricate, sophisticated and complex uh, than the old days when you picked up the, the newspaper or you listened to the radio and uh, you got some current affair program which was honest and gave a, 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 you know, a clear debate. Uh, we, 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 I mentioned this earlier. This, the nature of the dynamic of our communication in this referendum process is more about the quality of how we're going to have future discourses on political matters that are going to affect our nation. And we're going to have to take stock of it because it hasn't been a very nice basis upon which to consider a complex and complicated uh, matter. Even though the proposition that we're being asked to vote on is very simple. Recognise the Aboriginal people, give them an instrument, a body, so that they can make representations from their communities to the parliament and to the executive and leave the parliament in charge of everything. So that's the simplicity of what's being asked here. So the, the, the sidetrack of um, trying to think of how the campaigns worked or not worked, this, this is not the time to consider that. That'll come. There'll be a lot of, there'll be a lot of people wanting to write theses and you know, write learned papers and give learned advice down the track. Uh, but they, needed, they were needed you know, three months ago. Um, on how, how, to, how to win this campaign um, if we in fact lose it. But win or lose, as I've said, this is about the Australian people. Who are we going to think of ourselves as on the 15th of October after the vote? And are the Aboriginal people going to have a seat at the table or are they simply going to be picking up the crumbs that fall from the table as they have been for the last 200 years? Our next question is from Karen Barlow. Karen Barlow from the Canberra Times. Senator Dodson, thank you for your address to the Press Club today. Um, even at this late stage, a significant amount of voters appear to be bogged down by confusion between race and indigeneity. Um, there, there seems to be this, this link that can't be unbroken. What do you say to them? Well. I can understand people being confused if you're bombarded by all sorts of messages coming your way um, and, you, and you don't have a good foundation in, in terms of Australian history or the history of colonisation and settlement and its brutality. If you don't understand the, the, the frontier wars, if you don't understand the dispossession that's taken place, if you don't understand how people were put into missions and, and, and reserves and, and denied access, if you don't understand the stolen generations of kids being taken away and, and, the, and the description of that is tantamount to genocide, if you don't understand the significance of the High Court saying that terra nullius was a, was a legal lie upon which the foundations of our settlement were, were, were grounded in and that we, we need to do something about it. So if we, if we don't understand some of those basic things, then of course people find it difficult to see forward, to see forward. But the answer to that is not to vote no. That's not an answer. That takes us nowhere. No is not neutral. No is a denial of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. No is a denial to going forward on how we were going to improve things through a voice interacting with the parliament and with the executive in order to give its advice on how to do things better and to get better outcomes and to get better ways to implement it and to get the buy-in of the Aboriginal people to carry their responsibilities in so many areas where we know that's so, so critical to getting the changes. Let's bring in Eliza Edwards now. 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, you spoke about being driven by ongoing injustices. For people who are still going to be casting their votes in the coming days, who still might not understand the voice or are unsure of how it will help, can you explain to them in practical terms how the body would fix those injustices? Well, the first thing about the, the referendum is that it's a recognition of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples. So you're recognising the first peoples of these lands. If you, if you look at the Native Title Act, you've got to establish that you were here prior to the establishment of the colonies. So that's already in our, in our legal framework. So what we're, what we're saying is the referendum will recognise the first peoples of these lands. The second thing we're saying is that they ought to have a say to the parliament and to the executive on the matters that the communities have concerns about. Their communities have got concerns about and that the parliament remains in place. Now, there's nothing scary about that. There's absolutely nothing scary about that. There's nothing to be fearful of it. So if you're confused, look in the mirror and say, is that a good thing to do? What's the alternative? There's no alternative except more of the same, picking up the crumbs that fall from the table that they're, that they're out of largesse, largesse they want to give to us. That's what the alternative is. There's no credibility, there's no integrity, there's no respect for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and there's no buy-in by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to carry their responsibilities on the many matters that they want to carry their responsibilities about and to affect the changes to get rid of the poverty and to get rid of the, the dislocation that we see happening in our societies. Our next question comes from Andrew Brown. Um, Andrew Brown from AAP Newswire. Thanks for your address, Senator. Um, the Uluru Statement for the Heart um, called for a voice, treaty and truth-telling, and the government has committed to implementing all three um, parts of the Uluru Statement. If the voice succeeds and there's further debate on a treaty or truth-telling, does the tone and the um, divisive comments that have been put forward in the voice debate concern you for potential future debates about the Uluru Statement and its implementations? And also, if the voice referendum fails on Saturday, where would you see the Uluru Statement going from here? Well, we've, we've got a huge healing process to, to go through here. One way or another, whether we win or whether we lose, there's a healing process. And we've been trying to heal this nation you know, for, for a fairly long time. Uh, we've had a number of opportunities to do that. We've had Mabo, we've had WIC, we've had the uh, Bringing Them Home report. Uh, you know, we, we've had a number of occasions when we could look ourselves in the face as, as a nation and say, are these the awful things we've done? We've had the apology to the stolen generation. We've had the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. So we've had a number of occasions where we, we can look at ourselves and say, can we do better? And what are, what, are the, what are the impediments to us doing better? And some of those are in our attitude, some of those are historical, some of those are institutionalised. And so how we deal with that is going to be, as I've said earlier, it's going to require a different methodology. We can't just go back and have the discussion, have another conference in Canberra or another conference at, at Bill Warren or somewhere and, and have a talk about it. We're going to have to develop a methodology that goes to a dialogue, that goes to trying to find the common ground around contentious issues so that we can go forward with, with buy-in from all sides that have had divisions or differences on the, on the propositions. So we're going to have to develop that and we're going to have to develop scenarios. What kind of country are we going to be? Are we going to be known as the country that denies its first peoples ever existed or that they have no, that they have no redress against the nation for having taken their lands and subjugated them to the policies of denial and assimilation? You know? Or are we going to be a nation that says, as a modern democracy, we've faced up to that legacy, we're putting that behind us and we're not wanting to hand that on to our future generations so that we can build a new foundation upon which we can go forward with some hope and some trust in each other and some confidence that we're able to deal with the complex and complicated issues that we know still confront us. But to do that on the basis 
of respect and recognition in the constitution of the first peoples of this country. Let's now go to Amanda Kopp. Hello, Senator Amanda Kopp from the Community Radio Network. What role do you think the media has played in the debate so far? And in particular, what impact do you think publishing polls over the last few months has had? Well, it's a big question, always a big question when you say what, what's, what role the media has played, because there are many aspects to the media these days. Um, and the, the mainstream media, of course, um, there's been those that have been exemplary in this, are trying to provide information to the public. Uh, and I'd single out the ABC in relation to that, um, trying to make sure people got information, understood it, understood that there is a referendum, what a referendum is about, the kind of uh, positions that people have got, pros and cons. Uh, SBS has played a role in that. Um, some of the newspapers have run articles, some of them have run my articles, even in uh, at times, uh, the podcast plays a big role in some of this stuff. Obviously, the the uh, the other uh, social media chat uh, chat channels or communication channels have had a different level of uh, of impact. So, it's it's a bit hard to to weigh up the impact of of, uh, of the media when you just lump them all into one. It's a bit like lumping all Aborigines into one. We, we are diverse. We are different and we will have different views, um, and that might be news to some people. But th the fact that there's, there's, there's a different methodology that's underpinning the No campaign is something that we ought to be concerned about. And I'm not just saying that because I support the Yes campaign, but I am concerned for the future political debates and our election campaigns and the quality of our social and civil discourses as a nation around many other issues if we allow the dynamics that have underpinned the No campaign to dominate the future of how our democratic society is going to work into the future. And that goes to, to big questions about individualism against you know, the communal interest. Um, you had a second part to that and I've lost it in the process. Just on, on publishing polling throughout the course of the debate. All oh, right, yeah. Well, uh, you know, polling is not a science. It's a, it's, a, it's a test of attitudes by a select group of people. Um, and how you pick the group is, is based on some kind of, um, you know, random attitudinal decision. Um, I, I, I think... Um, the, the only poll that I'm concerned with is the poll that comes out of, out of the ballot box. Um, you know, when, when, the, when the Australian people say yes or no to the proposition that they're being asked about, that is to recognise the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, give them a voice to the parliament so they can make recommendations. When that poll comes out supporting the referendum or not supporting it, then I'll take note of what the Australian people have got to say. But prior to that, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's more about money making and creating fear. In, in, in the sense that there's been no real analysis of these polls. No one's analysed really why the No campaign is as effective as people say it is and how it's become effective. And, and what does that mean for us as Australians? I haven't seen any real analysis of that in the public space. And that's what worries me a bit. The next question comes from Dan jarvis Barty. Dan jarvis Barty from the West Australian. Thank you, Senator Dodson, for your appearance and for your contribution to reconciliation over a number of decades. A number of jurisdictions, including the ACT and, and South Australia, either have or are planning to introduce local or state-based Indigenous voices. Regardless of the result on October 14, would you like to see your home state of WA introduce its own Indigenous voice to Parliament? Well, we are a federation. We're, you know, a collection of states and we created the federal parliament. Um, that's what happened in 1901. But the, the states have still got jurisdiction and they have their own constitutions. And some of them have passed um, 
acknowledgements in their constitution, which have no legal effect. Uh, but states carry a lot of responsibility for service delivery, and they really affect the lives of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And if you recall, the, the reason why the federal government didn't have a role in 1901 under 5126 in the Constitution is because the states wanted to hold on to that power. They wanted to be the ones that controlled and managed the lives of Aboriginal people. It wasn't until 1967 that that head of power was clarified so that the Commonwealth Government would have a role in the lives of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in conjunction with the states. So the states have still got a very important role. So it's, it's right for the states, and I would encourage our state in Western Australia to look seriously at embarking upon the process of uh, looking at a, a, a voice to its parliament, uh, looking at a truth-telling process and looking at a agreement-making process. Uh, Western Australia is a, a complicated state because it's got a lot of people who've only been here, you know, the, in the last 15 years or so, who've come from other places. So their population is, 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 not, uh, is, is not as across the historic legacies as much as most people who've been here a lot longer, and certainly the Aboriginal peoples. But as a, as a modern democracy made up of states, then it would be clearly a very important factor of our national identity for our states to exhibit the best outcomes for voice representations of the Aboriginal people to their parliaments and to processes of truth-telling within their jurisdictions and for how the... Um, effectiveness of the service delivery programs are going to take place uh, within the ambit of their responsibilities. And, and that's, that's, that's as it should be. The role for the federal government is to provide leadership about this, is to provide leadership and to deal with any of the, the serious legacy issues that might arise. Uh, now, there are complicated arguments and discussions to be had around this, uh, and they'll take place, no doubt, in the future and by the future advocates that I can't I can't vouch for how they'll approach these things, the Aboriginal advocates, uh, but you know there, there, there'll be different views about how best to go forward on this. And uh, obviously, if the federal government is a very important political entity in the lives of most Aboriginal people, and seen to be the leader body uh, in how we resolve Aboriginal affairs or deal with Aboriginal affairs. It doesn't mean the states and the territories aren't significant in what they do and how they do, um, how they make policies that affect Aboriginal people and how they uh, incorporate or involve or empower the Aboriginal people to run, manage and take responsibility for the delivery of uh, the services and the quality of life for their people in their states. Now we are getting close to the end of the broadcast. There are a couple more questions for you if you're happy and you have the time to take a few more. Sure. Thank you. So our next, next question comes from Melissa Code. Hi, Senator Dodson. Thank you for your talk. We very recently had a very weighty uh, Disability Royal Commission report handed down, which obviously also had a section dedicated to First Nations people. And I'm wondering if you can reflect on these themes of calling for Australians to be more empathetic, more inclusive, have more regard to issues like personhood and how that impacts adjacent portfolios like the disability portfolio. Well, listening to your question, I'm reminded of the walk that Michael Long has done on two occasions now from Melbourne to Canberra, uh, the Long Walk. The first time John Howard was Prime Minister and he put to John Howard, where's the love for my people? Where is the love for my people? This is a rugged Essendon top grade AFL footballer. I played football with his father, coming to Canberra, walking all that way with other people, Paulie Briggs and others, uh, and putting this question to the Prime Minister, where is the love for my people? Now, I think that's a true question across the whole gamut of our society. How do we learn to love each other? How do we learn to love each other and not to allow hate and fear 
and ignorance to dominate the way we deal with difference and diversity within our society. We saw we, we overcome that in the LGBTI plebiscite. We, we made it very clear that that level of diversity and difference was something that we accepted and we, we get on with our lives. It's, it, we, the, the world hasn't fallen in. We've got on with our lives since then. So responding to those people with disabilities who are not often in, the, in a position to advocate for themselves is far more critical for us to be compassionate, to be caring, to show love and to be accountable for the way we discharge our responsibilities to them and to make sure they get the highest quality of care and compassion in the way we go about responding to their needs in a care capacity but also in a legislative capacity. So, you know, there, there, there are many people in our society that need to know that they are loved and cared for. The Aboriginal people need to know that from the Australian people and that's what I'm hoping they'll vote yes for on, on, at the referendum, that there is this message of love for the young people of this country, that they are loved and cared for and people want to see them have a future. Let's go to Ellen Rawnsley now. Senator Dodson, Ellen Ransley, thank you so much for your time today. Um, the Coalition have been saying for months now that they would have supported a referendum that simply acknowledged recognition of Indigenous peoples but didn't have a constitutionally enshrined voice. You've spent the last hour talking about this, but I wonder if you could put it very simply for Australians who are maybe soft no voters or undecided voters. Can there be real recognition for Indigenous Australians without a voice to Parliament? Well, the best way to respond to that is, it's like buying your, one of your children a brand new car on their 18th or used to be the 21st birthday back in the good old days. But at a significant point in their life, buying them a brand new car, but not giving them the keys and leaving it in the garage. And they had to walk past it every day of the week not knowing that they couldn't get in there and turn the key on and drive it. Now that's what a hollow referendum simply on recognition amounts to. It amounts to a hollow gesture. It amounts to no substance. It amounts to leaving the car in the garage and never giving the keys to the Aboriginal people so that they can drive the vehicle in the new direction that they know it can go in and why we as Australians need to be in the seat helping them to get there. Our final question from Canberra comes from Monty Boval. Hello Senator, thank you very much for your address today. Monty Boval from the ABC. When you were appointed the special envoy and the government embarked on this journey for this referendum, did you ever imagine that this debate was going to transpire in the way that it has? And how does it make you personally feel that it has been as divisive as it has? Well, I always thought there'd be division and there'd be opposition and that there'd be uh, uh, underlying racism and ignorance that would come to the fore. Uh, I've never been party to anything that have tried to advance the rights of Aboriginal people, whether it's been land rights, whether it's been improvements to criminal justice systems, whether it's been improvements to service delivery of housing, etc. I've never been in a position where there hasn't been backlash, opposition or, or simple um, uh, obstruction. So to me, nothing about the no case surprises me. What does surprise me is that this is the first time that we've had in the public space a clear division between Aboriginal leaders, between those who are supporting the No campaign and those who are advocating for the Yes campaign. And that that division is quite substantial. It's not just a matter of opinion. It's a division based on whether you understand our history, that this nation was colonised, Aboriginal people were forcibly subjugated, that they were denied the opportunity to have a say on how they were going to be impacted, or whether you say it was all cosy, 
and that we were picked up in a truck and taken into the winter wonderland. And we lived there forever in some sort of, you know, rose garden. Now, the sad part about the debate is that that division, and if the no campaign, campaign gets up, it'll be a debate about assimilation and co-option. That'll be where the debate in the future goes. And I don't think we should be having that debate because assimilation is a very toxic word to many Aboriginal people. But the process of engagement in the better things of the Australian society is something that many Aboriginal people are actually doing. But you start imposing upon them a philosophical and ideological outlook that says you have to be assimilated, you have to then go and have a bank account, and you have to live in the best suburbs and forget all your relations who are doing it tough and doing it hard, who are in, who've got kids in prison, who, who've got kids who've been taken away, and have got bureaucrats ramming down public policy upon them. You know, we, 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 we've got to contemplate the impact of a no vote on the future generations, the young people. We already know that the Aboriginal youth of this country have high in suicide rates. Now, why? They're not bad people. They're good people. Why do they don't see any future in the promised land that someone says we're living in? Why don't they see a future? And if we say no, we'll be saying no to those young kids and saying no to the good, those, those young white kids, the non-Aboriginal kids who want to see a better future for them and for their kids. They don't want to live with the legacy that the dinosaurs of the past have constructed for us. Well, just a final question from me as we complete this broadcast. What is your hope for the next generation? Well, my hope is that we have a successful referendum, uh, that is yes, that the Australian people speak, uh, that they want to recognise the Aboriginal people, and they want to see them have a say in the matters that affect their communities to the parliament. And then I want to see a constructive way for the political leadership to engage, to put aside. I mean, the opposition have been about trying to destroy the Prime Minister. You know, they're not about this referendum. I'd want to see them put aside that and focus on the things that they say they are concerned about, which are the practical reconciliation matters that John Howard talked about, but also to deal with the complexities of the legacies that colonisations bequeathed to us and that the High Court now has also raised for us and, and some of the other judgments of the High Court and, and, and how we deal with cultural protection, but we're not going there. So I, I would hope that we get a yes outcome, that we're able to get on with the legislation and that we're able to give the Aboriginal people a body that doesn't require huge bureaucracy, that has a consultative mechanism that makes people go out and talk to people in the regions and in their communities and ascertain their aspirations and report back to them on how they've delivered those concerns to the parliament and also to report to the people of Australia as to how the parliament is behaving in terms of the future direction of the Aboriginal people. So if the Australian people vote yes, there's an accountability, not only of the Parliament responding to the trust that the Australian people have put into the new proposition in the Parliament, in the Constitution, but also to the voice to report to the public on how our Parliament is dealing with the Aboriginal people and their future, because that's the great trust that comes from saying yes. Well, we thank you for your time today, Senator Dodson. Um, I don't have a press club membership with me, but I can promise you, you have a, a membership coming your way in the mail. Uh, please join me in thanking Senator Pat Dodson.